first Max Weber lecture for this uh, academic year. Today it is my pleasure to welcome Valerie Vance, um, currently the Aaron Binancourt Professor uh, Emeritus at Cornell University. Uh, Professor Vance uh, will deliver the lecture titled uh, Tit for Tat, the US-Russian Game of Weaponizing Elections. And before I give the floor to Professor Bans, I would like to mention a few highlights uh, from the career of one of the key scholars of uh, democratization, authoritarianism, US foreign policy, state building, and state collapse. Professor Bans obtained her BA, MA, and PhD degrees from the University of Michigan. Uh, after having taught at a number of uh, renowned institutions in the United States, uh, she became a full professor of political science at Northwestern University in 1990. In 1991, uh, she moved to Cornell University as professor of government, uh, where she's currently professor emeritus. Professor Bans has held uh, various leadership positions within her field. Uh, to name but a few, she was the co-director of the Institute of European Studies, director of the Slavic and East European Studies program at Cornell University, the president of the American Association for the Advancement of Slavic Studies, and the vice president of the American Political Science Association. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Professor Bans has published over 50 peer-reviewed articles in academic journals and newsletters. Uh, and has also written and published at least as many, if not more, um, influential book chapters. Her two seminal books, um, Subversive Institutions, The New Leaders Make a Difference, Executive Succession and Public Policy Under Capitalism and Socialism, and Subversive uh, Institutions, The Design uh, of uh, Destruction of Socialism and the State, are required readings for scholars of the transforming state's uh, society relations. Her other two books, Defeating Authoritarian Leaders in Post-Communist Countries, co-authored with Sharon Wolchik, and Democracy and Authoritarianism in Post-Communist World, edited with Michael McFowl and Catherine Stoner Weiss, are rightly considered the most comprehensive accounts of the democratic changes that the former socialist bloc countries experienced in the two decades following the collapse of communism. Professor Bans also has a new book, an edited volume, uh, titled Citizens and the State, Comparing Russia and China, which will be published next year by Oxford University Press. In uh, going over Professor Bans' CV, uh, I realize that she and I have something in common. Um, so we both spent significant periods of our lives dealing with authoritarian regimes. Uh, she scrutinized these regimes and undercovered uh, the reasons of their demise. Uh, while I spent my youth living under one and resisting it in Serbia back in the 1990s. So having lived through this experience, um, I have to say that I deeply appreciate Professor Zban's work, not only for its highest academic quality, but also for its contributions to the effort uh, to the thousands of activists that have fought and are still fighting for a better democratic future in their countries. And to conclude this brief introduction, I have to say that from an institutional point of view, it's a special honor to have Professor Bans here because it's her first time at the European University Institute. So, Professor, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let me thank everybody who has been involved. Is this, is this, is this, okay. Let me thank everyone who has been uh, involved in organizing this, uh, especially uh, Francesca and uh, Doro. Um, and I gave them a lot of reasons to worry this morning when I didn't show up for quite a while. Uh, but I got here. So, um, so the title is, as you can see, tit for tat, the Russian-US game of weaponizing elections. And what I'd like to do is to start with a quotation that was not tweeted uh, by our beloved president, uh, Trump, but it is uh, based on a conversation. I am not concerned about Russian meddling in the 2016 election because the U.S. did the same in other countries. Um, and uh, we know he's not concerned for some other reasons, but anyway, we won't go into them. Um, but this was at a very important meeting with uh, Sergei Kislyak and uh, as well as uh, Sergei Lavrov. And what was interesting about this meeting is that he said this um, a day after he fired the uh, head of the FBI, James Comey. He tends to say his most interesting things a day after he does something really dramatic. Okay, um, now it's easy to dismiss Trump's comment because after all, according to the Washington Post, it's actually now at 13,700 lies and misleading statements um, since, he, uh, was, uh, since he took the office of the president. That doesn't include the campaign, just since he became president. Um, obviously, Trump also uses his gut, not evidence or experts, to make his 
his opinion, uh, to form his opinions, as you can well see in terms of what he first just recently did with Syria. Um, and he also, of course, likes nothing more than keeping the Russian leadership happy. He fears compromise, he dreams of a Trump Tower in Moscow, and he, of course, adores all dictators. Never met one he didn't like. But the problem is there's a grain of truth here. Quite by accident, and certainly from Russia's vantage point, Trump made an excellent point. And that point helps us answer a key question that we've not addressed in this whole drama of Russian involvement in the US election. Why did Russia intervene in the 2016 US presidential election? What I'm going to argue today and lay out through a series of steps is that Russia was seeking revenge. Um, Russia wanted to pay the US back for its electoral interventions in Russia's zone of influence. Russia was playing an electoral game in short uh, that was very similar to the familiar international game tit for tat. Um, and most of you know this, but I just thought I'd put in. Tit for tat is a two-person, two-state game where each player models its actions on the actions of the other player. Translation from the Russian perspective. If the US uses elections to destabilize countries and install more friendly governments and leaders in power and undermine Russian stability at home and abroad, why can't Russia do the same thing? So I'm arguing that there's this larger game going on that helps us factor in some of the factors that are usually discussed. Okay, I'm gonna develop this point in this lecture um, through several stages. First, I'm gonna talk about US democracy promotion after communism, its goals, uh, policies, and consequences. Second, I'm going to look briefly at Vladimir Putin as an authoritarian leader, what he wants and what he fears. Third, I'm gonna argue that Russia coded US democracy promotion as an existential threat. Putin and his allies did so. Putin's dual response, and this is where I fold in another part of the story, which is Putin's dual response to the American threat was to invade Ukraine and invade in a different way the United States. Finally, I'll draw some conclusions just to remind you I'm a political scientist about the implications um, of these arguments for uh, how we think about elections, democracy, dictatorship, and some other things. Okay, so let me start developing this point. And I'll start again with US democracy promotion, um, which I spent seven years of my life working on in order to compare uh, the spread of the color revolutions in, in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. Um, so I just summarized some of these points about what drove that policy and how we can understand it. So these are some generalizations. From the mid-1980s, and notice that U.S. democracy promotion starts before the end of the Cold War, in fact, um, that this becomes a big priority. Um, but from the mid-1980s to roughly 2008, since uh, Obama was not so committed to this kind of policy, the U.S. and I'm leaving the Europeans out, but they were part, they were part of the story, Committed, were committed to promoting democracy abroad. What they tried to do were really three separate things. Uh, build new democracies, defend new democracies from domestic attack, and subvert dictatorships, especially the dictatorships that were seen on the cusp of possibly shifting in a more democratic direction. That meant in terms of policy priorities, promoting civil society, building democratic institutions, and supporting free I love this, free and fair elections in new democracies. Um, no irony is lost on this, so I'll just leave it where it is. Um, the geographical priorities, if you look at the distribution of US democracy aid, very much post-communist Europe and Eurasia. Other parts of the world received far less money. Um, so Russia in the 1990s was a huge priority for the US. Um, there's a wonderful speech that Václav Havel gave to the U.S. Congress in February 1990 when he essentially said, if you don't save Russia, you're not going to be help, able to help any of the rest of us in Eastern Europe. Um, saying essentially that how goes Russia will go the region. Um, Russian democracy, of course, in the 1990s was fragile. Um, it had a terrible case for the possibility of establishing democracy. It was a new state a new capitalist order. It was suffering from economic collapse, the likes of which are comparable to the Great Depression in the United States. Um, it had an ongoing war in Chechnya, um, and an absence of a state tradition, and it also had the humiliation of losing both the Cold War 
and the state itself. Rapid, rapid downward international mobility. The U.S. at that time also had a local partner, Boris Yeltsin, and he welcomed Western assistance, especially in 1996, when it looked like, <clears throat> looked like he could actually lose the election. It's a two-round two election. He got through the first round, but people were worried, in the West especially, that uh, Zhuganov, the, the Communist Party candidate, would win. In December 1999, Yeltsin passed his power to an unknown Vladimir Putin. Now, let me switch to Putin. So that gives you kind of a background of what U.S. democracy promotion was about. Now, let me turn to talking about Putin. We're at 2000 now. Putin's main goal, he's a really typical, but very, very clever authoritarian ruler. Um, so his main goal is to stay in power. But this was not going to be easy. Um, as it is any authoritarian regime, it isn't easy because the ruling circle and citizens can rebel at any time. In the Russian case, it was a form of authoritarianism that had competitive elections, and those elections provide, among other things, not just a chance for leadership turnover, but a focal point for popular protest. And international actors can threaten the leader, authoritarian leaders, directly through invasion or indirectly through the diffusion of democratic change, cross-national diffusion. So a key to Putin's survival is vigilance. That means that he does two things. He preempts challenges and he punishes challengers. As you all may know, most of the literature on authoritarian regimes focuses on the preemption side. But what I want to focus on in this lecture, because the US case is so important in laying this out, is that they also punish challengers. And it's very important to fold in both of those kinds of repertoires at home, and it turns out in the Russian case, abroad. OK, let me say a few words about Putin's politics and policies. So he was elected president in March 2000. His agenda was to move Russia in a more authoritarian direction, but keep, in effect, democratic decorations. Um, he consolidated power by centralizing the state, promoting political order, and that included bringing, eventually, the war in Chechnya to an end controlling the oligarchs, in over, enriching himself, growing the economy, and expanding Russian regional and global power. That, in a nutshell, is what Putin tried to do, especially beginning, as I'll say in a moment, from 2004 onward. Now, it's important to recognize that early on, Putin became a very popular dictator. That is to say, he has significant public support. And there's a Russian expression that kind of explains that. Um, in a lot of ways, and it said essentially that if your house is on fire, you don't worry about who the fireman is. Um, and that is the way the Russians essentially looked at Putin, um, as someone who was going to get them out of this disaster of the 1990s, which was an unmitigated disaster, however you want to, however, excuse me, however you want to look at it. Okay, for Putin, U.S. democracy promotion is a major threat. Um, First of all, as I said, the U.S. has a history of supporting democracy in Russia, and Putin saw that up very close in. It's a history of supporting and spreading democratic change in Russia's neighborhood. The U.S. pushes, and the U.S. also pushed, of course, to expand the EU and NATO um, onto Russia's borders, um, and that was part of the Clinton administration's uh, uh, decisions. U.S. democracy, the U.S. promotes democracy, we must remember, by subverting dictatorships. Um, it supports opposition parties, groups, and the media. Um, and it targets democracies under threat and authoritarian regimes that have competitive elections. What I'm saying is that everything the U.S. does, when you add it together, is an obvious threat to Putin's project and Putin's image of what he wants Russia to come. But the biggest threat were the color revolutions. The color revolutions refer to a series of electoral turnovers uh, that occurred in the post-communist post space. So it was a cross-national wave of unexpected electoral defeats in authoritarian rulers. It starts in 1998 in Slovakia and moves to Croatia, then Serbia, da -da, in 2000, um, and then it goes to Georgia, um, and then Ukraine, and then, not a perfect fit here, Kyrgyzstan. Amidst all that, there are a series of fakes failed color revolutions as well. I mean, basically how the color revolutions worked was to promote democratic change by using elections and sometimes popular protests as well 
to remove authoritarian rulers from power and empower the democratic opposition. They used a so-called electoral model to accomplish that, basically building a stronger opposition, uh, using a lot of resources in order to, I mean, just to give you some examples, first time the opposition ever actually campaigned outside the capital city was in the color revolutions. They focused on local elections, winning those first to gain more credibility. Um, there are a variety of different things um, that one, one can talk about. Um, that are part of this is classic electoral kind of model that one sees in democracies. Basically, mobilize, create, build your support, get them to the polls, um, and in, in, at the same time, weaken the support of the, um, of the authoritarian incumbent. This classic kind of what I would almost call an American model of elections. Um, not that we still do that quite the same way, but um, so it is a sophisticated approach to gathering public opinion and preferences and seeing that your voters get out. One of the things that this approach has to do, which is very tough, is to convince people to vote and vote for the opposition. They see the opposition as can't win and already compromised. So the question is how to build that. And, and they spend a lot of time, usually they try to come up with people running for office that are squeaky clean, very clean. Uh, the people that are not compromised by the previous regime. But they do massive, massive voter registration and turnout drives. One of the things they did in Serbia, as they did in Ukraine, um, is that they had um, voter registration materials and people going around with rock stars all over the country so that people would actually sign up to vote. There was a huge increase in the voting and turnout of young people um, in the color revolutions. So what you do basically is to use elections in order to promote regime change. Initially it is a government change, a change in who rules, party-wise and individuals. But then it moves on to a switch in, in regime and deals with the regime as well. Um, now, the US was involved in the color revolutions in a lot of ways. First of all, it kind of marketed the model. Um, and secondly, um, it was uh, uh, involved in terms of providing some resources. For example, in some of the more authoritarian states, such as Serbia, um, what you had was alternative places for opposition to meet because there was a problem to meet at home, so they met in Budapest, actually, pretty regularly. Um, you also uh, helped them with how to advertise, etc. But what's interesting is that what you try to do is bring together a fractious opposition to work together. In other words, you don't have 28 parties running. You have one party running against the incumbent. Um, et cetera. So what you try to do is make a more effective opposition, and it requires enormous work. And in some of the cases, in the early cases of the color revolutions, um, the countries were not authoritarian enough to question if the incumbent lost, would that incumbent leave power. But once you got to this circle of cases, once you got to Serbia, it was clear that Milosevic would not leave power, and it was clear also that he was stealing the election and lying about the results. So what you have to have in place is a double counting process so that you can report the real votes and report them before the regime reports its votes. And the second thing you have to do is prepare for popular protests to in effect deliver the verdict of the voters by taking to the streets. And that's what you saw in Serbia, that's what you saw in Georgia, and that's what you saw in Ukraine. And now, a final point on the color revolutions. Um, they were also involved a coalition. I, it's very easy to look at this process and see the US as the central player, but in fact, it was a coalition. Um, and the coalition involved US democracy promoters. The Europeans were also involved, um, uh, so-called graduates of the color revolutions. And that's what was interesting. So when the Serbs were victorious against Milosevic, they then went to Georgia and they helped Georgia prepare for its color revolution. And then both Serbs and Georgians went to Ukraine in 2004. So this is 2000, 2003, 2004. Um, so you have the graduates who participate in this, and so you develop this region-wide network of people working together to use elections to defeat the authoritarian ruler. And finally, of course, you partner with local oppositions.
um, that is civil society groups and political parties. One of the things that happened in all the color revolutions is that the civil society groups would have nothing to do with the political parties and vice versa. But they both had important roles to play and so one of the things that had to happen was that they worked together in order to carry out this kind of regime, this kind of leadership change as well as regime change. Okay, these are just a few pictures uh, from, from the color revolutions. These are the protests, uh, the so-called bulldo bulldozer revolution in Belgrade in 2000. Um, this is the Georgian Rose Revolution. And this is the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, 2004. Um, okay, now for Putin, the color revolutions were a perfect storm, his worst nightmare. First of all, as I said before, you support the, the color revolution, support opposition parties, civil society groups, and independent media. Second, they exploit electoral opportunities in competitive authoritarian regimes. Putin can't get rid of the elections, but on the other hand, he expects to win them. So it's a complicated story of how he wants to control them. Um, third, you depose authoritarian rulers and you use a portable toolkit. In other words, what you did in Georgia is kind of what you did in Ukraine is kind of what you did in Serbia, etc. cetera. Um, you generate popular protests, which for a person like Putin, you know, KGB guy, the idea of that kind of political turmoil is horrifying, scary, etc. They have a real allergy to that kind of thing. Um, you catch leaders by surprise, the question of diffusion, after a while the leaders, authoritarian leaders, caught on to what might happen to them. Um, and you occur, and, and all these color revolutions occurred in regimes like Russia and often bordering Russia. And you build, if it succeeds, if you have a leadership turnover, you build closer ties with the West, your ties with Russia weaken. So they threaten, what I want to summarize here as I say is that the color revolutions were a perfect storm because they threaten Putin's job security and Russian national security. They were his worst idea of what could happen. So in 2004, we saw a turning point for Russian democracy. First of all, the Orange Revolution took place in Ukraine, huge protests. Putin's candidate, Yanukovych, loses strong evidence of US involvement in that. For example, if you ever wondered where the orange tints came from, they were not manufactured in Ukraine. Uh, they were delivered to Ukraine uh, earlier, uh, and the U.S. was involved in that. The same year, this was the same year as some other events in, in Russia that were very important, such as the Beslan School Massacre and Putin's landslide election. This was his first election where he won really big. Um, Putin then decides to defend against the colored revolution in Russia by sabotaging the Yushchenko government in Ukraine. Yushchenko won the election um, in 2004. What, what I'm implying here to think about a bit is that Putin sees threats to him as not just domestic, they're also international. He saw Ukraine's orange revolution as a very serious threat to Russia. And it wasn't just because Ukraine would then start a line with the West, which was a worry. It was also because he was afraid that the so-called democratic virus in Ukraine would spread to Russia. And Russians have, Russian leaders have always feared that that kind of thing could happen in certain strategic parts of the empire, such as Ukraine. So at home, he focuses on abroad and he also focuses at home. At home, he starts a campaign to reduce the independence of the Russian media, the opposition, the oligarchs, and Russian governors. 2004 is a huge, 2004 to 2005 is the big switch. This is when you begin to see that Putin puts his cards on the table. So the pressure begins to build for Putin to respond, uh, to craft a stronger response to the color revolutions and these kinds of measures. So in 2010, Putin's candidate Yanukovych won the 2010 Ukrainian elections. Uh, for, for those who are interested in trivia information about the United States, we can thank Paul Manafort for that victory. Um, Paul Manafort, as you may or may not know, was also Donald Trump's campaign manager um, and is now wearing an orange jumpsuit in prison. Um, Putin's popularity at this time 
um, starts declining, roughly speaking, beginning in mid-2011. That really has to do with the series of mistakes he makes about, about in effect, selling himself as someone who is uh, foreordained to win the upcoming election, as opposed to carrying on the charade of uh, this is a real competitive election and I could lose. Um, Russians protest electoral fraud, December 2011, parliamentary elections, Hillary Clinton, who becomes one of, of course, Putin's favorite people, as well as Donald Trump, supports protests and criticizes the Russian electoral process. This is while she was Secretary of State. Um, the Navalny campaign, uh, Navalny is an important, a very important opposition leader in Russia. And his campaign for mayor of Moscow in 2013, first of all, he does a lot better than anyone imagines. He won a bit over 20% of the vote. But he uses what can only pass for the electoral model, and I don't think that Putin missed that. That the way he conducted that election looked very much uh, the way uh, Genjic, for example, ran his campaign in Belgrade, uh, you know, uh, et cetera. So it was very striking. So basically, to make it very simple, and I think it follows, Putin thinks, thinks that the U.S is instigating a color revolution in Russia. It's trying to threaten Russia from without, and its traces are beginning to see, traces of that kind of activity and U.S. involvement begin to pop up. 20, 2014 becomes a second critical turning point in this story. Here I cannot overemphasize a conference that took place in Moscow in 2014, in the summer of 2014. And the focus of the conference was the color revolutions. This was primarily a military conference. Um, the GRU, the intelligence wing of the Russian military, um, as well as every major military figure in Russia was at this conference. And what they were arguing is that essentially the colored revolutions were a major threat to the Russian regime, state, and international stability. Um, this conference was bizarre in the sense that the Russians decided that every single challenge to an authoritarian leader since 1989 throughout the entire world was instigated by the United States. The United States apparently was a lot busier than the United States knew in terms of fomenting revolution all over the authoritarian world. Um, they had 75 or so color revolutions. It was amazing the way they just decided the U.S. was the bad guy in the story, and this is what they did. They also, 1989 was the beginning of their story. The fall of communism was a color revolution. Even though, of course, there were, for example, no elections. I mean, there were, but, you know, it wasn't the major mechanism. So, um, what they talked about at this conference was cyber warfare as the solution destabilize the West and increase Russian influence on Western leaders and policies. Uh, fan the populist flames and court anti-establishment candidates and parties. So this is 2014. This is actually the summer of 2014. Here's a summary of Putin's view, a statement he made in November 2014. In the modern world, extremism is being used as a geopolitical instrument and for remaking spheres of influence. We see what tragic consequences the wave of so-called color revolutions led to. For us, this is a lesson and a warning. We should do everything necessary so that nothing similar happens in Russia. Pretty straightforward. Uh, nothing, nothing much in there. Okay, now, kind of what I've done so far um, is to kind of treat the background of what Putin wants, what he's afraid of, and to look at what the U.S. was up to with the color revolutions and how Putin and people around him interpreted it. And now I want to talk about the response uh, to this. Um, and I'll leave out the question of increasing domestic repression, although that's very important. Domestically, Putin changes the Constitution, cracks down more on the opposition and media and courts Russian nationalists. But the international side is what I want to focus on. There are two parts to the story. One is launching covert interventions in Ukraine and the U.S. starting in 2014. Well, in Ukraine, number one, and in the U.S. starting again in 2014. 
So what we see is a very clear kind of pattern from, 1914, from 2014 onwards. Growing authoritarianism at home in Russia goes hand in hand with more aggressive interventions abroad. That these two things begin to be very closely coupled and track very closely together. Okay, um, a few pictures. Uh, this is Yanukovych on the left and Paul Manafort. Yanukovych was uh, a Putin guy who won the election, as I mentioned, in 2010, and, and a person who was helping run his campaign and made something like $25 million, which is not bad for a short time helping run a campaign, is Paul Manafort, who then went to the United States to work for Trump, and then later on did some other things. I, think, I don't think we know the end of that story yet, of all the details. Um, okay, and this is Manafort with, with Trump. Uh, there are many Ukraine, Russia, U.S. connections, to put it mildly. Um, and it would take, it would, it would blur this thing if I tried to show you all the different connections. But, okay. And these are the protests in Moscow in 2011. So let me start with the, with the international intervention in Ukraine. And I'll be a little brief with that. I've written some things about it. I don't want to go into it because I want to focus on the U.S. case. So this is March through April 2014 to the present. As I'm sure some of you know, in, in December 2013, um, nine years after the Orange Revolution, Ukrainians again went to the streets in huge numbers to protest the fact that Yanukovych, Putin's guy in Kiev, um, tried, to, tried to put on hold his promised agreements with the European Union. And what Ukrainians saw was that what they feared, in many cases not all, was that they were going to be drawn back into the Russian orbit, and they would be, in effect, closed off of any contact with the West. The protests went on for quite some time. Suddenly, in February 2014, the Russian-friendly government in Ukraine, Yanukovych's government, imploded. You know, it was a textbook case of what happens in the early stages of a revolution. He just ran away. Um, and uh, he, you know, and ran away and then eventually ended up in Russia, of course. Very, very soon thereafter, within days, Russia, having lost its man in Kiev, immediately invaded and then annexed Crimea. Um, Russia then carried out a campaign to destabilize eastern Ukraine. And of course, a war broke out between the Ukrainian government and Ukrainian separatists, backed by Russia, in many cases Russians, who did this, um, in eastern Ukraine. Um, what we see is a lot of people have died, and it is, as we know, a frozen conflict. Um, this is a sort of picture of the protests there. Okay, why did Russia do this in Ukraine? I think they were scared, number one. They were scared that Ukraine, after the government collapsed, would go democratic, join the EU, and especially join NATO, that was their biggest fear, and serve as a base for the diffusion of political change to Russia. This is what I mean by marrying Putin's job security and Russian national security, that it was a threat on both counts. What were the goals in the, in the, when Russia invaded Ukraine? If it can't control the Ukrainian government, which it lost control of, then settle for sabotaging democracy, sabotaging the economy, and, of course, by cutting up Ukraine, sabotaging the state. NATO and EU will not be interested in having a basket case become a member, which is what you know, Putin helped happen in Ukraine, and Russians will not want to copy Ukraine's transition to democracy. In other words, Ukraine would not represent an alternative, attractive model to Russia under Putin. And so that, in a way, blocked the possibility of any kind of diffusion of democratic change. And what I would say is that this is a classic example Russia's actions, a classic example of preemptive authoritarian politics, trying to stop a problem before it delivers. Okay, now we get to intervention two, and, and, and please, I want to be clear here, I'm pairing these two on purpose. I do not see them as separate actions in many ways. Uh, intervention two is when Russia gets involved in the 2016 U.S. presidential election. Essentially, one bad intervention, that is to say, Russia's views of what the U.S. was up to in their neighborhood, deserves another intervention, which is to say, Russia intervening in the United States. 
So they used, uh, uh, the details of this are, are way too complicated to go through, uh, but basically Russia used Russia Today, Sputnik, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, YouTube a lot more than people realize. They hired Nigerian actors to play American blacks and made small videos of this to scare the hell out of various Americans um, on YouTube. Um, and Instagram to bombard the US with fake news, polarize the US, and mobilize Trump voters while demobilizing Clinton voters. They also, of course, built many ties with US officials and groups in the NRA, uh, the National Rifle Association. Um, let me just say here in talking about this that, that, that if you read the Mueller report, I'm sure none of you have read the Mueller report. Like most Americans, you have not read the Mueller report. Um, well, I read the Mueller report, and, and I can tell you that the, the way the Atlantic Monthly characterized it was perfect. It said, no collusion, but not for want of trying. There were so many officials flirting with so many Russians through the Mueller report that it was just overwhelming. What we did not have was that final little piece that said collusion. On the other hand, there was loads of evidence on obstruction of justice. But let me just say, the Russians did a fantastic job of courting the Republican Party, including many members of the uh, uh, Trump campaign. Okay. So they built ties with various groups. Uh, they accessed the DNC voter, the Democratic National Committee voter information and models. Here's the interesting. They basically did both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. They let loose all the bad stuff they could find in the Democratic Party to compromise Hillary Clinton. They have held on to the Republican Party files. No doubt, if Trump misbehaved himself, some of that stuff would come out as well. They basically saved it for a rainy day. Okay, um, so these are other, other details here, but basically what they tried to do was shape the political party and voting landscape in the United States. Um, I don't have time to develop this argument. I think, I, in my own view, Russian electoral interventions were absolutely decisive in the outcome of the election. But let me just give you a few examples that I put up here. Um, one is that um, Russian postings on social media during the campaign tracked extraordinarily closely with Trump's campaign themes. There have been several uh, computational studies of this, of social media, and it's really striking how much they moved together. Um, you know, you don't have to have a cause and effect in that. The point is they were very, very tightly wound with each other. The way to think about this is that they reinforced Trump's message. They amplified and spread Trump's message as well. Um, Russian Facebook postings uh, reached approximately 130 million users, a number just short of actual voter turnout in 2016 election. The election was decided by a mere 80,000 votes in three states. And you know, of course, that in terms of popular vote, Trump lost by almost 3 million votes. Uh, but it turned out that Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, unfortunately, became decisive in terms of the uh, electoral college votes. Okay, and I end with this discussion of what the Russians did and how decisive it was by a wonderful quotation, um, and which gave me the idea for the lecture, right? If there is tit-for-tat escalation in U.S.-Russian relations, this is someone warning Trump. Trump will have difficulties improving, improving sanctions and with Russia. Um, and, you know, I can have trouble reading that, which has just thrown the USA elections to him. Right out there. And this email was sent by KT McFarlane, who for some reason has, has rarely been questioned on this, who was the Deputy National Security Advisor in the early months of the, of the uh, uh, Trump administration to Michael Flynn, who of course is now awaiting sentencing, uh, and the National Security Advisor. Really, really interesting guess. The point is, she understood Russian intervention as throwing the election to Trump. Um, amazingly um, straightforward. Okay, what was the Russian calculus? How do we understand their intervention? Russia opposed Hillary Clinton because of NATO expansion and her reactions to the 2011 Russian protests. Let's be clear, 
I mean, this is a very sexist thing, but basically one of the things that made Putin mad, he blamed Hillary Clinton for Bill Clinton um, in terms of what he did while he was president. Um, they thought that if Russia would win, whatever happened, if Hillary won the election, she would be a weak and compromised leader. If Trump won, he would be, maybe this joke won't come through here, Putin's Borzoi. Borzoi is a particular kind of Russian dog. Usually they say Putin's poodle, but I think let's make it a Russian dog, a Borzoi. Okay, in either case, the U.S. democracy would be in trouble by virtue of what Russia did. It was very similar to the Ukrainian calculus, as were the methods. Ukraine, in many ways, especially the fake news part, was a dress rehearsal. Okay, these are two, two of my favorite pictures of Trump and Putin, um, two guys that were made for each other. This is my next one, is my favorite one. Look at Putin arrives late for this affair in, in, in Paris. Look at Trump. He's never been happier in his whole life. I've never seen a look on any leader. I've never seen him look like that. He is dying. He's so, so, and Angela Merkel is funny in this too. She's going, oh shit. I mean, I shouldn't say that, but oh no, there's Putin. Um, anyway, back to uh, the picture. So, so let, me, let me just draw some conclusions and I look forward to your questions. Um, I want to draw two straightforward conclusions and then draw a few implications. So the, the point of the lecture is to argue that the Russians were engaging in tit for tat when they intervened in the 2016 U.S. presidential election. They were involved in a game in which each country intervened in elections outside their borders in order to destabilize unfriendly governments, install more friendly governments, and expand its international influence. Second, though, there were important differences that I've not played up um, and talked about much in this lecture in how the U.S. and Russia approached the weaponization of elections. The U.S., as I argued earlier, promoted democracy. Russia was more interested in destabilizing democracies. Um, it wasn't so much a question of promoting dictatorship as it was weakening Western democracies. U.S. intervention in many ways could be understood to level an unlevel political playing field of elections and competitive authoritarian regimes by trying to compensate for the obstacles under which the opposition was running. Russia tilted the playing field, in effect, in a favorable direction um, and used social media to do so. Russia relied on the distribution of fake news through social media. Whereas the U.S. used much more, shall we say, traditional electoral instruments. Get out the vote, get out the people you want to vote, to vote, strengthen the opposition, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it did not rely on, on social media. Now, I want to draw a few implications and then, and then I'm finished here. First of all, there's an implication about Ukraine and the U.S. Russian interference in the 2016 U.S. election was closely tied to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. As I said, in Ukraine was a dress rehearsal as well for the U.S. invasion. Both began in 2014. Both were responses to and modeled on the color revolutions. Both sought to destabilize another country and bring its regime and foreign policy closer to Russia. Um, but in terms of the dictator's toolkit, Ukraine was primarily about preemption stopping the problem before it gets worse. And the U.S. was mainly about punishment, getting back at the U.S. for all its various activities in Russia's zone of influence. Implication two, um, I have to highlight the ironic side effects of democracy promotion. Democracy promotion, as we've seen in this case, we could also bring up cases such as Azerbaijan, Belarus and some other cases, democracy promotion can promote authoritarianism, not democracy. As authoritarian leaders take aggressive actions at home and abroad to protect themselves. In other words, by accident, the U.S. helps solidify and make more extreme certain dictatorships in the post-communist region by virtue of democracy promotion. Okay, the final implication is that elections have changed for the worse. I don't think this is very surprising to any of us. 
The conversation about elections used to be about the role of domestic, not international actors in political processes. It used to be about democratic, not authoritarian politics. The legitimation, not the degradation of democracy, because elections were thought to reflect and promote civil liberties, political rights, and accountable government. The weaponization of elections at home and abroad, and I could talk about the US and the various things that's going on at home as well as abroad, in both these countries, there are attacks on and interventions in elections, not just abroad, but also at home. Um, the weaponization of elections at home and abroad in Russia and the United States has um, severed the linkages among voter preferences, electoral outcomes, and public policy. Elections are becoming a problem for democracy, not its foundation. Thank you.